Welcome to the upstreamlife.com. I'm your founder and editor, Vishal Krishna. I love talking deep tech, although I'm a fan of history and my moorings are with history. I'm telling you, this man can tell you a thing or two about how history is moving with deep technology. I have Nicola with me from TDK Ventures. Hi, Nicola. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. What are we going to be talking in the podcast? We're going to talk about challenger technologies, helping the planet become green, and entrepreneurs, and why India now. And CVCs. That's part of it. I thought of all of it. Absolutely. Guys, enjoy it. If you're a scientist, if you're a deep tech entrepreneur who's never had the support, write into me. I'll connect you to TDK Ventures. But first, enjoy this podcast and send us some deep, meaningful questions. Enjoy, guys. Thank you very much. Nicola, it's a pleasure that I am talking to you. It's been a while. How are you? Good. Thank you, Vishal, for having me today. You know, today we're at this CVC conference that's going to happen and TDK Ventures is all about deep tech. So my first question to you would always be, what is deep tech? There's so many people saying so many things. Yeah, well, deep tech could mean many, many things. For us, it means material science. So it's at the atoms level. Mm -hmm. And we're looking for innovations at material science that can really change the world. And that's why we invest a lot in climate tech, because a lot of the innovations come from breakthroughs of material science. Okay. In India, when we think about deep tech, we think data, AI, software. Yep. But you said it is also materials. It's at the atom level. Would you care to explain, is there an intersection of the two? Of course. So if you think about SaaS and software, this is a bits. And here we're talking about atoms. Mm -hmm. But the hardware and the software needs to work together. And that's where the atoms and the bits get together. And if you think about digital transformation, this is the interconnection between the uh, analog and yes. the digital. So we both, we absolutely need both sides of the same coin. That, that's a very interesting answer. So that is what deep tech is, according to you, right? Uh, what interested you in deep tech? When did you get well, into so it? So you have a lot of expressions like deep tech, hard tech, yes. and so on. I think that deep tech just means that it goes really deep into the material science. Yes. And then you build solutions on top. And solutions needs not just the hardware, but also the software. Absolutely. So if you think about TDK, which is our mothership, they develop uh, components, like electronic components, sensors, including MEM sensors, which is where I came from, uh, InventSense acquired by TDK, but also battery. All of this needs different types of chemistry, different types of components, different types of structure to enable a total solution that also includes software. How did this love for hard tech, deep tech begin? And how did the CVC happen? I always liked technology. I did an engineering uh, school, which was all about microelectronics. Mm. So that was even before it became sexy. And I just love technology. I love the way it creates solutions to problems. So this is maybe the engineering background in me. But it's also about what can we scale. And if you think about solution that scale, it needs to answer a real pain point and it needs to be profitable so that as it scales, it's actually profitable and can reinvest into making it into a bigger solution. So uh, one, one, one thing we always like to do when we invest at TDK Ventures is to stress test what we think the technology needs across multiple generations. Because for the full benefit to be brought, you need to think about everything that needs to be supplied to that technology to scale. And sometimes you won't have enough materials because they are rare or sufficiently rare that it will work for one or two or three generations, but not the fourth generation. Correct. That's a wonderful answer. And you maintained earlier while we were having coffee that deep tech has to be profitable. I've been covering tech for 20 years now. And whenever it came to the chip level science or the atom level science in India, we always thought it's going to be the realm of acad academia. And sometimes it was also charitable where a lot of the large organizations would fund an institution to run deep tech. Yep. Uh, and it would make great papers for the world. But you, you're saying that deep tech is profitable fundamentally. No, no, what I'm saying is that for deep tech to scale mm -hmm. and to scale to the full benefit yes. it, it's, it wants to achieve, it yes. needs to be profitable. But most times deep tech is not profitable to start. And that's where venture capital, corporate VCs, comes in, and also, of course, universities, is they try to support entrepreneurs and innovators to create this technology 
that will not be profitable at first. Yes. We may not even know if there is a market for it, but we want to explore. We want to identify if it has a potential for contributing to society. And if it does, it needs to be done in a way that's profitable. Yes. Otherwise, you won't be able to scale it because at some point you run out of money. No, this is wonderful. At, at that juncture, right, you've convinced, obviously, TDK Ventures is born out of TDK. And you convinced a large corporation that we, ha we can do this. Do uh, you want to quickly tell us how that happened? Actually, the beauty of TDK is that it, it's an 88 years old tech firm yes. that has gone through many pivots. Yes. But it was actually a university spin-off. Very entrepreneurial. And You're let me saying, actually give you more fantastic. because I know in India, everyone knows about the cassette. Yes. But it started as a B2B material science company with ferrite materials. Yes. Moved to B2C with a cassette that yes. every people in India know about. And every time I have interviews in India, people ask Absolutely. about the cassette. And then moved back to B2B with uh, batteries, component electronics, sensors, and so on. And so if you think about a company that was a university spin-off, that received money from an angel investor, that was really the starting point. And if you think about the DNA of TDK, TDK which is all about contributing to society, Having a corporate VC that is here to help entrepreneurs accelerate their dream and their mission makes total sense. It does make total sense. And I just want to make a little segue on uh, your investments. And your investments are, for me, I feel that you're looking at the future of humanity. And I like the fact that in all your interviews, you talked about the movement of geopolitics, the movement of technology, and that will decide the fate of the world going forward. For example, your investment in order flight, I thought it was fantastic for movement of cargo, yeah. right? It's also going to be a B2C application maybe in the future. Your investment in Ascend Elements, yeah. uh, battery recycling is definitely necessary, which when I look at it from an Indian context, there's so much to do. Yeah. So where would you like to start? Your investments, the geopolitics and the technology, how do they combine and well, what, are your thesis, what is your thesis? Actually, we like to think from first principles. Yes. Please. And we try to identify something that's not yet obvious for everyone. Yes. If it's obvious to everyone already, then it will be priced in into our investment. So you want to be right mm -hmm. maybe two years before it's obvious to everyone. Correct. Okay. Correct. And so if you think about, you mentioned auto flight, which is a vertical takeoff and landing mm -hmm. aircraft. When we invested in 2020, most people said, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. We are never going to need air taxis and so on. I think at this point, people can see how it's achievable, why it would be cheaper than the alternatives and quicker and more convenient and safer and cleaner. So now it's becoming obvious, but when we invested in 2020, it was not. You also mentioned Ascend Elements. Mm -hmm. Today, or at, uh, when we invested in Ascend Elements, it was only 10 people, <laughs> but we could see that their technology was legit, really, really credible, thanks to the TDK and ATL world-class experts in batteries. They could validate this. But we could see the market was small for recycling batteries at that point. But there was no doubt that as EV cars need to be recycled, as you start to have more and more gigafactories that have scraps, you need this recycling. And so we could invest very early before it was obvious. But today, it's obvious to everyone we need to recycle this battery. We are running out of these materials at some point. So the, the role of a corporate VC or a VC is to think about where to invest before it's obvious. And you have to do it from first principles. And in both cases, it's about, there's no doubt in our mind, once we looked at all the data and the insights we collected, that there will be a, a market for, a massive market for air taxis, and there will be a massive market for recycling batteries. So just with that, we looked at, we, we, we invested. Now, when we talk about geopolitics, it's also part of how we build first principle investment thesis, which is what do we believe could happen in the future? And we actually play devil's advocate. We believe we could make the assumption that it's going to be a globalized world with no frictions between countries. And what does it mean for investments? But we could also play the other side, which is, okay, let's assume the world is unfortunately going worse and with more friction across yes. countries and more geopolitics and more wars. What does that mean to the flow of materials, of technologies, and so on? And suddenly we realize that if that happens, there are a number of technologies that don't have a chance to contribute to a cleaner planet, 
they will have now an opportunity, and this is a ray of hope I've mentioned before, they will have an opportunity to start scaling and become profitable and complement the existing clean tech technologies we have, like wind, solar, and yes. lithium battery for energy generation and energy storage. So sometimes we think about geopolitics as facts. We're trying to see what could happen if this continues in that direction and what if it's not. And then we make different bets. And that's actually part of the venture capital job is to have a portfolio of bets. You know, this is interesting. I, and you use two keywords, fragmented and friction. So you want to make sure that fragmented, though, it can become an opportunity and reduce friction. And what do you mean by that from a geopolitical standpoint of view as an investor? Fragmented because nations are going to take their own decisions on climate tech or anything game-changing in technology. Is that the thing? And by frictionless, you mean you see more of these entrepreneurs taking bets that are necessary for local markets. I think you can slice it in many ways. Yes. But let's take a simple slice of rare materials. Yes, please. Um, how they are being mined, how they are being transformed, mm -hmm. how they are being transported. Yes. If they go through one country in particular, mm -hmm. and that country starts to be having uh, tariffs or different actions against other countries, these other countries need to find a way to have alternative technologies that today the incumbent technology relies on these materials. And so you just have to think about what are these alternative technologies, what we call challenger technologies, that could benefit from this geopolitical friction. At the end of the day, every crisis is an opportunity. And as much as we hate what's happening in the world today, there is an opportunity about what that means for a cleaner uh, planet. No, this is fundamentally brilliant. The world being fragmented as it is, it's also a supply problem, uh, taking control of these rare materials. Uh, where do you see entrepreneurs playing a role here, for example? Uh, to me, this is a key, maybe the key point I want from this interview is for entrepreneurs to realize there's a huge opportunity with the challenger technologies. And we talked about recycling of batteries, but we could also talk about recycling of copper and uh, platinum group materials. Uh, we could talk about nuclear fusion, which yeah. I think is a huge technology. We as a, uh, a society, as humanity, we need to invest and deploy. Yes. Uh, but it could be a number of other technologies that are challenger technologies like sodium ion batteries yeah. for energy storage. We can't just rely on lithium, especially if it becomes difficult to source and expensive right. to source. Sodium ion is a good challenger technology, which is not yet profitable, but we can see that with these opportunities that what's happening around the world, we may actually get to scale profitably. And at that point, we have one more tool into our clean tech tool set. You mentioned nuclear fusion. Uh, you mentioned sodium, right? Uh, I want entrepreneurs to understand this, right? Uh, because the conversation in India has always around being lithium ion for the battery side. Yep. On the energy side, we are yet to move towards renewable in a large way, although 23% of our energy comes from renewables. Yep. Uh, do you want to talk about nuclear fusion first and then talk about uh, what you mean by peak energy uh, and, and then also talk about elements, uh, especially in the, in the world of uh, sodium, where do you source materials from? Can you tell us that? Well, let's start from the very yeah. basic yeah. first principles. We have two energy generations that are green today, yeah. which is wind and solar. Yes. It's not always windy and it's clearly not sunny at night. So it's intermittent. So we need some um, technologies to help with that. One way is energy storage today with lithium ion uh, solutions, but it could be in the future with sodium ion. That's a way to complement solar and wind to create a stable, continuous, clean energy to the countries. But nuclear fission and nuclear fusion are continuous energy supply. And if we think about the difference between nuclear fission and nuclear fusion, nuclear fission, believe it or not, is actually not that difficult to do. And that's why we could do it decades yes. ago. But it's inherently unsafe. Yes. And that's why it's really problematic for many countries and to consider And we've had examples. It. We've had examples exactly. of Exactly. Nuclear fusion is the opposite. It's extremely complex. It takes the best minds, the best entrepreneurs, the best innovators, the best engineers, but it's inherently safe. Mm -hmm. And so if I think about uh, society 100 years from now, 
the technology, I think they would be most grateful we would have developed and invested early and made sure this happened is nuclear fusion. Because at that point, you start to, cr to create an opportunity for everyone to have green, continuous, cheap energy. Yeah. And that actually in itself will change geopolitics, which relies today on uh, petrol and Oil. other materials. So you need to think about what could be the changes. And maybe that's what we will need to think about in 10 years from now is yeah. if nuclear fusion can become ubiquitous or start to become mm -hmm. ubiquitous, what does that mean for our next investments? Fantastic. Now going to green hydrogen. You've already made an investment in Vardaji. Uh, and they are talking to Indian companies as well as we I speak. I hope so. And, you know, they are. They told yep. me. The interesting aspect of this is uh, India presents an opportunity, both in terms of entrepreneurship and commercial applications. Yep. Uh, you've traveled around. So what do you think? What's happening? What is the pulse of the market when it comes to deep tech? So, of course, I can't share too much because of our investment yes. in the space, but we believe green hydrogen has certain applications where it can really be successful, profitable, and really do good. Okay. And this is where Verdagi is looking at, is making sure that it finds a place where it can start to be deploying profitably. Right. As it does that, it can start to scale and do more applications. Mm. And so what I'm hoping is that countries identify these applications that are the most impactful and hopefully the one that displays fossil fuel consumption. Yes. And so this is where I'm really hopeful that we find opportunities for Verdagi to grow, but also the green hydrogen yes. as a whole. But another company which is actually helping is PH7 Technologies mm -hmm. we invested, which does copper and PGM okay. recycling mm -hmm. with a, a green solvent. And what is quite special is that it's needed for the hydrogen fuel solutions. So we are trying to actually identify all the small places that could help the solutions to become really green and to scale and to recycle some of the materials to do that. This is, this is fantastic. So it's an opportunity for all our scientists to talk to TDK Ventures if they want to go commercial, if they're already set up we a company. We want to meet with all the scientists that wants to create solutions for a greener planet. So actually AM batteries is a good example mm -hmm. of an investment we made. When we invested in AM batteries, it was two part-time professors. Okay. It's hard to believe today, but it was two part-time professors when we invested in the company. And now this is one of the best solvent-free battery process company you can imagine. Fantastic. I mean, that means scientists in India have a chance now to meet a real deep tech fund. In fact, I would say that this is India's first deep tech opportunity. Would you invest in scientists who have already set up companies or would you say that, look, we are willing to look at your technology and invest at you at an idea stage? Or is your hypothesis going to be, say, OK, set up a company, make a few rounds and then let's see. What, what are your thoughts on this? I'm glad you asked about India. I thought you were going to forget about India. No, no, go on, please. No, I'm not going to forget India, of course. Go on. <laughs> so, so we see beautiful opportunities uh, in investing in scientists and entrepreneurs and innovators in India. Actually, I think India today is very different from 10 years ago or even five years I ago. I agree. We start to have these young, very smart minds. In the past, they would go to the US or somewhere else. Absolutely. Brain drain. And now they stay and they create companies and they start to innovate for India, but with a global ambition. So yes. I think for us to come to India, I feel we should have come here five years ago, but mm. it's never too late to start. Mm. And last year we invested in three companies yes. in India already. So we are getting our, our footing, if you want. Mm -hmm. But I believe that there are a lot of opportunities for TDK Ventures to invest early with these entrepreneurs. Typically, we like to invest at Seed, mm -hmm. Series A. That's really our sweet spot. And this is really because we can influence the outcomes the most when we invest early. We can help the entrepreneurs with technology, with go-to-market, with guidance, with helping raise the next round. All of what we call TDK goodness at TDK Ventures. And if I simplify what TDK goodness is, it's when we help entrepreneurs and they validate it was valuable to them. So it's from the recipient's point of view. Mm -hmm. And so what we are hoping with these India-based entrepreneurs is to help them to mature technology, get their footing in India, but then start scaling worldwide. No, this is brilliant. A quick thought on the two scientists that you invested in, you know, and they scaled up a company. A quick thought to scientists here that what is the meaning of scaling? Because going from academia to a commercial world can be very brutal. Your thoughts on that, why they can do it. And they have to talk to you, of course, yeah. but how can they do that? 
So the biggest challenge for entrepreneurs, and you could argue scientists, is the scaling part. Scaling part is the most complex part of any venture because you need to find the right people to recruit. You need to find the right investors to help you and, and really avoid the bad ones, but really the one that can really add value beyond capital. You need to meet customers and partners and maybe sign a lot of contracts. And for scientists, that's not what they've done so far. They've yes. been thinking deep into technology and they have to start trusting others they, that join the project. And so what, what I think TDK Ventures and other VCs and CVCs that really want to do good have done is really help these entrepreneurs very early to think about how to set the company well, how to protect the company, how to create defensibility, but also how to then go fast and to scale. And, and of course, venture capital is not for every entrepreneur. When you take VC money, you're basically saying, I will go fast and I will scale high. It's no longer going to be a project on the side. It's going to become Full something time. that needs to uh, be uh, capturing an explosive market opportunity. So I don't want people to think that VC money is for everyone. But if you want to have a massive contribution to society, if you believe your technology is going to help to do that, then having VC money to accelerate with the right investors, with some TDK goodness or equivalent from other investors, that's key to scale. So we talked about uh, you know the the companies that you like with uh, the entrepreneurship market in India and how we'll support scientists as well. Uh, you need partners. I think TDK is here to say let's go invest with good people, people who believe that deep tech is the future. Uh, a little color on that. What could be a CVC's partner? Well, actually, we all need partners. It's not just TDK yeah, Ventures. Absolutely. Entrepreneurs need good partners. Absolutely. And, and what's nice about venture capital is that you very quickly identify who's very good at helping mm -hmm. entrepreneurs and mm -hmm. then you invest together. Because yes. when you help entrepreneurs, they are more likely to be successful. That also makes it a better investment for venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we partner is very important. I think we have today good partners in India. But what I'm hoping, especially with this event we are in today, that we are going to also bring more corporations, yeah. to bring more corporate VCs from outside India to invest in India. And that will create even more partners to invest in hard tech. This is interesting. So you're going to bring partners from abroad to come in and look at India. I mean, this That's could a be plan for today. Uh, let me know the color. What does the world think about India today? I mean, in terms of deep tech. I mean, when you talk to all these partners, uh, do they have a view on India? I think everyone knows about the quality yes. of the engineers coming from India. Absolutely. So there is no doubt about the brand power of India. There is no doubt about the political will in India uh -huh. to build infrastructures and to be a powerful country. Uh -huh. No doubt about it. The opportunity that changed, I think, from the last five years to today is that this brand power is staying in India. Uh -huh. And that creates this opportunity, which I'm not sure every corporation have understood the full impact of it. But this is what I'm hoping to convince more corporate VCs that are coming today at the event to think about and then start moving into India. Okay. And Nicola, before we move into a lot of the questions about your childhood and everything, I want you to spend a little time on the challenger technologies. And in the past, in many of your interviews, you have talked about how Brazil got into ethanol yes. in 1975, yep. took that decision so they can reduce their burden on their economy what is their dependency on yes, fossil fuel? On fossil fuel, right? Which was becoming too expensive with geopolitical Absolutely. concerns. Yeah. So how does that what what bearing could a challenger technology have in this era? That was 1975. Ethanol is still very valid today, yep. even today in, in, in Indian context. Yep. Uh, how do you advise these guys, scientists, engineers, you know, anybody who loves technology, to look at challenger technologies and what do you mean by it? Challenger technologies is technologies that are not yet profitable today, okay. but that have the opportunity mm -hmm. to be profitable. Mm -hmm. And there is an accelerant or a catalyst, I'm not sure how mm -hmm. you want to say it, with a geopolitical friction mm -hmm. that creates opportunity mm -hmm. for these challenger technologies. Mm -hmm. So for the scient scientists and for these entrepreneurs and innovators who are thinking mm -hmm. about technology for a greener planet, mm -hmm. maybe my message is don't be discouraged that this may not be profitable today. Try to work with hard tech VCs mm -hmm. and hard tech CVCs mm -hmm. to identify if there's a potential market, a potential application that could really make a difference. Mm -hmm. And at that point, try to scale with them. Okay. Uh, do you have specific examples for India? The biofuel example is very good. Yep. Do you have an example yep. for the current world? 
Well, I'd like to think that nuclear fusion is a okay. good one. Okay. Sodium ion. You, don't, you mentioned that. So I think sodium ion energy storage is clearly a, also a good okay. one because temperatures in India are very different. Absolutely. And the wide range of temperatures across the India mm. country is mm. important. And energy storage is still a key element for intermittent technologies like wind and solar to really take the full benefit and to avoid issues with the electrical okay. grid. Okay. Now, the question would obviously be in their minds. They'd say, okay, so what is the thesis? Have you got a particular, Indians will suddenly ask, what are the sectors that you want to look at? You know, is, there a certain, is it sector specific? I keep saying that technology can be sector agnostic, but you know, for their sake, what would be the sectors? So this, I'm going to let you ask our investment managing director, yeah. Anila Chuta, yes. in your next it, podcast. Absolutely. Because he can actually deep dive into each specific. Absolutely. And if you give him a chance to prepare in advance, he would be really deep. We'll go in. deep in that. Exactly. But any particular points, just so that they have a view now, and obviously I'll ask so, in detail with Anil Pashar. So we like to invest in digital transformation and energy transformation. Yes. But let's just look at energy transformation. Yeah. There is no... No doubt that the demand on energy is only going to scale. Okay. And there is no doubt that the current electric grids, not just India, but every country cannot support this increase in mm -hmm. energy demand. So any solution that the scientists mm -hmm. or these entrepreneurs have in mind to help with these huge demands of energy growing. Yes. And it could be the EV cars, but it could be the electrification of your home. It could be the fact that we are Mm. in need of this energy for all these data centers and hyperscalers mm. and uh, generative AI and all of yeah. that. This is going to increase energy demand. So if you think about technologies that can help with that demand and to make it green, this is going to be a huge demand huge. no matter what. Uh, let's get generative AI out of the way. You know, that's okay. an important thing for me. Everybody, every software company says that I'm going to eat it up and all that, uh, you know, with data. But I'm sure generative AI and deep tech, you mentioned earlier that it is an atom level and the bits level exactly. are analog versus software combining together. Uh, your thoughts on Gen AI quickly. Well, generative AI and large language models, and maybe at some point, small, large language model, which is funny to say, they need a different type of infra infrastructure. They need different type of communications. Mm -hmm. They need different type of chipsets. And we are investing in companies that actually can deploy generative faster. Mm -hmm. We invested, for example, in Grok, which is an amazing company in the US, in Mountain View, which can run LLM much, much, much faster than any chipsets today. And every time people try it, because they have a free chat, which maybe you can yes. post on your uh, podcast comments, the, always the same reaction is, wow, because you ask a question and boom. It's, yes. it's back. It's that so fast. all of this generative AI is going to create new opportunities. Mm -hmm. You've traveled across India now and you met many people. India 10 years ago is different. Now it's different. The opportunity is great, but there's a degradation of climate. You know, you see uh, temperatures rise, but Indians are being ambitious. They're building great technology. How do you see this as an opportunity for, you know, beautiful entrepreneurs like them watching this? coming out and saying, I care about the environment. I care about new technologies that can progress humanity, not just India, but for the world. Your thoughts on meeting people? So I think first, I know India and the Jugad mindset. I think what's interesting is that we're going beyond Jugad now. It's no longer about creativity with different constraints, but it's actually creativity with technology and hard tech mm -hmm. with different constraints. And what I think is the opportunity with all these smart people that stays in India versus moving out is creating this solution that can help the planet. Now, what's maybe interesting is that most people is talking about wanting to be green for the planet when the global south is just catching up to the global north is unfair. But at the same time, it may be the opportunity where India can shine in the global south. Because if you develop the technology to accelerate this green technology in a profitable way, there's yes. nothing stopping India to become the next big uh, powerhouse for green energy. And be a leader at that. Yeah, Absolutely. I, I, I think guys watching this, write in. I'll get Nicola and Anil to answer all your questions. Uh, you know, deep tech gets better with uh, deeper questions. So. My point is now, India is nascent in the entrepreneurship. We've gone through the software curb. I'm glad you guys are here at the right time. You said five years too, too late, but I think you're early as well. And you're going to build this ecosystem. Well, we need to be early to invest early. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah. You're going to build this beautiful community. 
how, I mean, a, a segue into your thoughts on selling a company strategically to a large corporate. Uh, that's a great way to actually participate in the deep tech story as well. Build technology that large firms can yep. use it for the benefit of society. Yep. Uh, that segue is into your personal life. How do you scale a company personally? How did you do it? Well, actually, let me answer differently. Yes, please. I think the reason that we have so many investors investing in SaaS company in India mm -hmm. is because India has been very successful at it. Correct. And we need the same type of success stories for hard tech and deep tech. We need this success story of entrepreneurs starting something really hard mm -hmm. at atoms level and being very successful with exits. When you start to have these success stories, there is no doubt it's going to be this snowball effect where more entrepreneurs, more investors, mm -hmm. including coming from outside India, are going to come and support the next level, the next generation of entrepreneurs. And there's also one thing which is very important is that when you have an entrepreneur that has been successful with a successful exit, Typically, they move to the next big yes. uh, challenge Absolutely. and they create a new company to do a new challenge. Mm. And these entrepreneurs are really helpful, these repeat entrepreneurs, these serial entrepreneurs. As you know, we invested in Aaron in Exponent mm. Mm. Uh, Energy. That's a serial entrepreneur. He started in Acer and yes. we saw his potential and we just invested last year in, in him and the team. That's the type of people you want more and more in India. Okay. It's mature in the US and Japan and China and Europe, would you say? And that's now coming into India? Yep, I think so. Mm -hmm. and, and this is our bet to come here and to invest early because mm -hmm. we think this is a time where India will shine. Okay, my last question to you is uh, your personal journey itself. How do you get influenced? I mean, are you one of those uh, guys whose parents were into climate tech or not early climate change, you know, giving you the right input saying, you know, Nicola, you have to do this, you have to do that. Or you a self-made guy saying that you traveled out and then realized that I need to contribute back to society. And hence the culmination of all this. A little bit about your personal life, please. So to be honest, this personal journey about clean tech, energy transformation is quite recent. Okay. It's really through the teamwork inside TDK mm -hmm. Ventures. We have mm -hmm. a great team who really go deep into technology and first mm -hmm. principles. There's no doubt that we identify technology we want to invest in mm -hmm. and understanding how big an impact we can have when we invest in the right technologies mm -hmm. that can scale mm -hmm. very, very big. Mm -hmm. This is what gave me reasons to believe. Because many times when you see what's happening with mm -hmm. climate change and all these disasters, you could feel powerless. Probably for the first time in my life, I feel like I have a, a possibility and a potential to impact positively. And together with my team, together with yeah. all of TDK yeah. and, and people who are helping us, together with our co-investors, together with the entrepreneurs we bet on, we have an, uh, an ability, a very rare ability yeah. that makes us excited every morning to wake up to really improve climate change. I, I'm glad with that honest answer because you said that you discovered it only a decade ago and then getting into this, you know, I'm so happy. Did you spend a lot of your time reading about things that influenced you as what you are today? Uh, I want you to share those books, movies, art that influenced you and why, if you can recommend that, maybe it'll influence others. So okay. I would want to delve into that, please. Uh, maybe I'll talk about one book which I really like which helps to build great teams. Yes, please. and it's called the Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Led So uh, there, there are five type of dysfunctions, mm. and what's interesting is the first one is the one that's most misunderstood. Yes, which is trust. They think that trust is about I trust you, you trust me, we're going to work well. Actually, it's at the team level. Do I trust enough the full team to share my vulnerabilities, my doubts, my mistakes? Am I trusting the team enough to do that? And if I am, then we can go to the next level. Yeah. And the next level is conflict. Am I able to have a conversation with you where we disagree? Yeah. And we disagree within a trusted environment. Yeah. Once you do that, yeah. you can commit because yeah. you have opened every, uh, everything about what you disagreed on and therefore you can commit. And what's really good about commitment at that point is then you start to have accountability. Mm -hmm. Because people said, yes, I disagreed with you, but now we commit with this plan and we're going to do it and you have accountability. And the most beautiful part of that is result. Once you have all of that, you build a high-performing team that deliver on results. And so this book, I would recommend everyone to read because it helps you to think about what behaviors 
can I adapt or improve or change so that I get a better team high performing. And I'm, I'm super happy and proud about TDK Ventures team because we are really trying to be trusting each other, radical transparency. Yeah. So whenever someone joins TDK Ventures, they have access to nearly everything from the time we started in 2019. Every decision we made, every improvements we make, every conversation we had with nearly 7,000 startups now, everything is open. But we also go into conflict. We try to make sure that we are all in agreement and then we can be accountable. Then we can start to have really good results. So that, that's a book that was really fundamental and I think that's worth for everyone to read. And what's nice is that it's a very bo easy book to read. It's, it's like a storytelling of a startup in Silicon Valley, but you have to read the final few pages because that's where everything hits home. I'm going to put that in the description for sure. One thing I liked about your team, and I'll be very honest, you have a global team experienced across different cultures. Yep. And also it's Japanese in a way. It's all, you know, you know, the Japanese system of precision. Yep. There's precision, there's cultural experience around. Uh, Nicola, I really think that you are in a wonderful uh, life with, uh, with your team making impact. I thank you for being part of this uh, podcast. Yep. And I wish you all the best. Thank you, Vishal. Thank you so much. Thank you.